Thank you uh, very much uh, for the invitation, for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm leading the, the Facebook AI Research Lab here in Paris, uh, where we have like 45 people right now doing fundamental research in AI. So I'm not going to give an overview about what we do, I'm just going to focus about my line of research, uh, which is about uh, natural language processing and understanding. I will try to explain you what I think of, of, about that. Um, so I want to start by saying a, a few motivation about why do we want to be able to be talking to machines, which is something that's very up in the air uh, right now. So I, I put the, a picture of the movie Her, which is a very nice science fiction movie. I really say science fiction movie uh, because we are very, very far from that. Uh, but, uh, but close to us, I think language should be the most natural interface between the digital and the physical world um, because this is the, the way we communicate and I think we should be able to use that um, in, uh, in more of our interaction with also the digital world. So I can give a few uh, examples of what I think like assistants should be able to do, uh, like uh, grant accessibility for people with disabilities. It's something that you start to see, it's something that actually Cordelia mentioned a little bit by describing videos. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, it's something that is uh, uh, big, going to become a big focus. I think it's connected to the robotics effort as well. Uh, it's about to break loneliness and to have people in the house uh, that are actually feeling alone and that can actually talk to a, talk to a, a machine that can actually help them and also warn uh, people when th there is trouble. And the last one, uh, which is uh, especially important for us at Facebook, is the, um, to have like, some kind of a, a way of basically having a, an assistant that can help you like, mediate and monitor online presence which they can actually be like be able to explain what we see online, why do we see it, uh, how can we block it, or can we allow more, etc. There is a lot of this that is going to be needed uh, in terms for people to actually trust more uh, digital tools, uh, and uh, and so that's that's also a, a big motivation for us. And and actually more than having an assistant who can book your plane ticket for you, or book restaurants for you, which is usually an example that's given. Uh, that is, I think, for me less uh, maybe less relevant today. So um, the problem with that is that of the technology is a bit lagging uh, and very lagging. Uh, the current system are, are very far from being able to have natural interaction with people uh, for multiple reasons. So um, a paper last year, which is called like, Building Machines That Learn and Think Like People by Brendan Lake and colleagues, uh, stated, uh, it's a very nice paper, stated like basically three like uh, uh, components that machines should be able to have. And I think that's... that's that's interesting. Uh, the first one is that like they should be able to build causal model of the world, and they should use that as some kind of internal knowledge representation. They should be able to ground language into it, and this, this grounding should actually give interpretation to language. And the third one is that they should be able to learn composi compositionality, or what's called learning to learn, which is that basically they should be able to update their internal knowledge representation by uh, receiving new language. Um, uh, this is, uh, so I think basically that right now the system can't, most of them can't do any of the three, or we are start to do a little bit of each of those. Uh, and, and the problem that is that basically uh, this, to be able to have this, these properties, we should expect machine to be able to learn high level abstraction that could be able to be like used in this eternal representation. And right now we have a lot of problems to do so. Um, so. Uh, why, uh, why, do we have, why do we have problems? Because people could say that actually we have a lot of methods that are actually able to do uh, in, uh, knowledge reportation, that can do reasoning in knowledge reportation, that can actually like, uh, do a, uh, very, very complicated uh, processes uh, that I would term into the term of symbolic system, the system that are based on ontology, on knowledge base, uh, all the field of inductive logic programming. Uh, but of course, when people talk about learning right now, they talk about this part which is a part of our neural networks, correlational nets, recurrent network, um, because, uh, that's what I put, they have been game changers in multiple applications, and they're basically, right now, what seems to be the most promising uh, approach. So I, I put like a, a big, uh, some element to compare the, both, both of them. Uh, I might be missing a lot, but, uh, so the neural network, they can scale to very large data sets. They can be used to non-domain experts, so people can be able to, should be able to understand what neural network is, but basically with the library, like TensorFlow, PyTorch, actually, is getting easier, but you don't have to be a specialist in the data that you're using. Uh, it's better, but you, it's not always the case. It's very robust to noise and ambiguity in data, and it has been very, very useful in many applications. On the other hand, it's very data angry, and it works mostly for supervised application. Uh, it's very hard for to learn new tasks uh, given the previous one. 
it's not interpretable, and the C reasoning that can do neural network is still very simple. On the other hand, you have the symbolic system that usually works in small scale conditions, require heavy expert knowledge usually, and are very brittle and don't work very well with noisy or ambiguous data. And as a result of that, the applicative success is, I said limited, I would say much more limited than basically what we see here. Okay. Um, but they can work for very few simple, they can rely on high level abstraction, they, are, they can be interpretable, they can even be probable in some, in some cases, and they can do very complex reasoning. So that's, that's how I see uh, the, the, the fear right now. And so basically a conjecture today, it's a conjecture, so I might be wrong, uh, is that I think that neural networks and friends, which means that because the good neural networks we have now uh, won't be able to do, but maybe the evolution of it can be adapted to be the best of both worlds. So, and I will try to give you a few elements today about why I think so. Uh, and uh, I can be open to question and criticism, of course. Um, so first of all, I think we should be moving to architecture and neural network that are the interplay between symbolic and continuous models. So right now, when we talk about like uh, convolutional net or recurrent neural nets, it's basically like layers of uh, continuous layers with uh, activation functions stacked on, on top of each other. Uh, I think we should be looking for a more complicated uh, structure, and we are already. And so when I say we should, there are a lot of work that, that started doing that. Um, we should be able to encode structures such as the symbolic database should. We should be able to, the model should be able to discover structure in a structured data, and they should be also able to operate a symbolic components. Um, so I think that's, and I think that's what we're going to have uh, in the next few years, more and more. Uh, the, the main problem are designing those, but also training them, because usually you will have a system that combines differentiable and non-differentiable parts, and in this case, uh, the training, you can't really do the backpropagation that you used to, and so then you have to basically uh, uh, find ways to do that, and I think that's one of the major, uh, major blocking, blocking parts right now. Uh, of course, reinforcement learning is getting very interesting, and it can actually do, uh, overcome some of the parts, but reinforcement learning requires reward, and an environment providing the reward, so it's not ready to work for like full language interaction just now. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the task of question answering uh, and give an example of that. Uh, because I like question answering because actually we can, it's a task involving language, but that we can uh, evaluate pretty easily if the answer is correct or not. Um, and so I'm going to uh, talk about three, three parts. How vector space can encode structured data from knowledge bases. How neural network can be adapted to reason over symbols and how to learn to uncover structure for how they can learn to uncover structure from unstructured data. So the, the first part uh, is going pretty short, but I think it's very interesting, especially the latest work, is that basically the, one of the building blocks of the symbolic system is what's called uh, knowledge basis, where that can be seen as like a big database of, of knowledge uh, with a very big structure and a lot of uh, knowledge that has been encoded into them. Or this is, they can be depicted as database, relational database or as graph. So I just give a very simple one here that would have like two types of relation, born in and child of. And then this database would say that Paddy is born in Miami and that basically Paddy is the child of mom. Uh, and, uh, and also, so this, and you have database like this, like massive, like Google Knowledge Graph for instance. And of course, one of the goal of this is to be able to predict the missing relation because then you're enriching your knowledge. Uh, but there, this could also be like some kind of the embryo of what the knowledge representation with which you would like the system to be grounding their language in could be. The problem with that, if you if your database that usually they are pretty big, it's millions of entities, uh, hundreds of thousands of relation types. If you want them to be interesting, and you know billions of of triple like Patty born in Miami, um, usually they are incomplete. They are always missing information in that. And so you have to rely on processes to add uh, knowledge to that. So either the processes are automatic and then they, they, they add a lot of noise in the database, which is not very good for the solver, or you do, you do that by hand because you want very high certainty, but then you're very slow, and so the, the database has a lot of missing information. So the idea that has been uh, started in the last few years was basically to try to see if you can actually transform this, which is a, a graph, into something that would be much more uh, neural network friendly, uh, that, we, uh, like, that would be like continuous representation, where basically each of the entity become uh, a vector, so this is a representation in the 2D space, very easy, uh, very, very simple, and, uh, and each relation becomes some kind of similarity function that is learned in this vector space. Uh, and so uh, in, the, in the last five years, a lot of work has been doing that, and I just wanted to give you an example about the, the latest one that comes from uh, my colleague in, uh, 
in Facebook uh, AI research in New York, where basically what they decided, and I won't go into much into detail, but basically they decided to embed the, 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 the simulated measure would be in hyperbolic space. And what you, what you have right, what you obtain is that basically uh, the performance for predict the relation is, is better than what you have with the traditional solver. But even more interesting, and that's why I present this one, uh, is that basically we see that the neural network can discover and encode the structure in the input data. So it's better with a picture. So this is the WordNet mammals. So WordNet is a knowledge base uh, where the nodes are, are word, uh, word senses, and they are connected by the, the type of relation they have together. Like uh, a head is a part of a body, uh, etc. And so there is a very big uh, structure in that, especially there is a very big hierarchy, which is the is a, the fact that basically a rodent is a mammal, or, uh, or a carnivore is a mammal, etc. So you have a very big hierarchy. And so what they did, what the researcher did for this experiment, that they removed all the relations from the hierarchy, and they kept all the other ones, okay? And they learned the embeddings. And what you see here is in 2D, is basically what the network found. And basically what's very interesting is that the network, by uh, learning to represent this with this very nice metric, is able to recover the hierarchy. Okay, so, so that basically shows that we have some actually neural network-based continuous models that are actually able to discover the hidden structure in data. Uh, and in various structured data like this. It works for multiple, uh, and they're very good at making plots, so that's what they use in that as well. Um, they did that for another one, which is the air transportation network, for which there is no clear uh, hierarchy in the system. There is just like the fact that the, the, the airports are connected to each other with like some, um, the fact that there's a flight in between them. But you see that basically the big hub are going closer to the center. Oh, yeah, I didn't explain. Closer to the center, the more general you are, the more you're on the... You're, uh, you're on the outside, you're closer to the outside, the more, the more specific you are. And so basically you see that naturally you will see the big hub in the middle and uh, the more smaller airport will be on the side. So that actually gives me um, hope that basically we can, uh, we can design actually some method that are able to, uh, to, to, to find, to use a structure in the data and to try to find a meaningful uh, representation from them. The, now I would like to move to a second part which is more about um, having networked, I can do some reasoning using symbols. So to do that, I will present just a, a set of uh, a tool that we use, which is called the baby task, which is a set of 20 tasks that uh, have been designed to foster uh, research and reasoning for neural network. So the way they, they're, they're designed is that you have a series of like small stories, like John dropped the milk, John took the milk there, Sandra went to the bathroom, John moved to the hallway, Mary went to the bedroom, and then you ask a question about the story, like where is the milk, okay? So this is synthetic data, so it's generated by a simulation. Uh, the, the, the language is very simple, uh, but you can control everything. You can control how much coreference you have, you can control the size of the vocabulary, you can control how complicated the reasoning should be. So for instance, this task is called two supporting facts because to, to discover where is the milk, you have to find basically who has the milk, I think it's John, and basically where is John as the latest location. So you have to look at two evidence. And you can do that uh, more and more complicated as you want. And the, the community really like that because it's been used in more like 300 papers uh, to be able to try to see how well a uh, neural network could actually do this very simple reasoning. And you can train that on a, on a CPU in a, in a few minutes, so you don't need like very massive GPU. Um, and interestingly, they were actually very challenging for neural networks. That's why they are, <laughs> they've been useful. So for instance, the LSTM are tested on this. Uh, I, I just showed two tasks, but there, there are 20 of them. They were able to ju just complete four tasks with 10K training examples. So the setting is that you give 10,000 stories of this kind and you give 1,000 stories that are different but with the same process and you see if the network with 10,000 examples was able to learn the reasoning. Okay? 10,000 for this is already huge. Okay? I'm giving, we also have a training set with only 1,000 examples and the results are much worse. So there is definitely a, a, lot, of, a lot of discover there. But even with 10,000 examples, LSTM are failing. And I think this one, for instance, the LSTM can't solve it. Whereas, I mean, so what, what, what uh, basically this uh, area of research uh, and this task uh, brought is the new uh, way of actually doing some kind of uh, reasoning with neural networks by using an external memory. So the one we propose at FAIR, um, but there have been others, and I give a few citations here, uh, are basically a model that combine a symbolic memory component Okay, that could actually store some information and, uh, and a learning uh, component, uh, component is learned, like uh, basically a neural network or a current neural network, for instance, that is learning to answer using the memory. Okay, 
So uh, attention has been mentioned before, so this is heavily relying on attention. Uh, and this, this came actually as the first time as the first uh, wave of attention models. And so they basically do attention on their memory and they use that to answer. What's very interesting in this model is that they have this symbolic memory inside, but they can be trained end to end uh, by uh, backpropagation still. And, uh, and they don't require to supervise which uh, part of the memory has to be used for answer. So basically, uh, I will show you a, a new picture, it's going to be better. So, Basically, just to show you how the memory network works. So you have a story, okay, which is like the story I showed, John dropped the milk, etc. And then you receive the question. And the way it works is that first of all, it's going to populate the memory with the, with the sentence. So here it's very, it's very, uh, it's just like the sem sentence with the words. And they give, here you give a, an indicator to give what, has, what is time, the time step of each sentence, because the order is very important here, okay? Uh, and then you, uh, what you do, you have uh, a way to uh, have a, word, uh, a vector representation for the question. It can be done basically by a recurrent neural network or by just the sum of some word embeddings. I mean, you basically have a way to have a vector representing this sentence. And then you also have uh, a way, it can be the same, to represent each of the memory slots. So let's say this one is the first sentence, this one is the second, etc. So you have a way to basically transform the symbol into vector. And then the first step is that you're going to compute the dot product between the question representation and the, and the report vector representation for each slot. And then you normalize that by a softmax function and it gives you this, which is basically the attention weight. What this gives is that how much each memory slot is relevant to the question. So you see, for instance, the color are supposed to show that basically these two memory slots are more relevant to this question. Okay, so this is the first step. It's basically what, what can be called a, an addressing step, where basically the question is going to to look at the memory slot and try to find out the ones that are relevant. And then using that, you're going to have a, a reading step where basically you are going to use uh, also a representation for each of the memory slots. But it's usually a different set of weights than this one because you have some weights for reading and some weights, some weights for addressing and some weights for reading. And you're going to basically compute a weighted average which is going to give me a representation of the question according to the attention weight. Okay, and so then I have a weighty, I have a representation of the memory that represents uh, modulated by this question. Of course, if you have a different question, I will have different weights here, so I will have a different representation here. And what's very interesting is that you can do this hop. So you can do that multiple times. So you can say, I read the memory once. It gives me basically that I have to focus on this one, let's say. Then I'm going to go back again and say, knowing that I have the question and I have this, this sentence highlighted, do I need to look for another one and another one and another one? What you obtain at the end, after a number of hops that can be usually between one and five, let's say, um, you will have this vector that is the same dimension as this one, but basically it's encoding the question plus the, the content of the memory uh, after this attention step. And the final step is actually a classical one, is that you will have an uh, answering module that can be many uh, typical layers for, for our network. Here, I think it's, a, it's just a ranking on this picture. So you have to compare the question with all the possible answers and return the good one. What's very nice is that for the training, you get the, the signal here. So let's say you predict uh, the wrong answer and you get the good one. Then depending on your loss, you're going to compute the gradient here. You can backpropagate all the way because the softmax is differentiable. So you don't have to, to worry about the fact that the memory is non differentiable. And so this was in 2015. And so here it gives you an example. So I think the task we looked at is this one. So John dropped the milk, John took the milk there. And where is the milk? So this is the question and this is the story. And so this gives you what were the sentences that you should use to answer. Okay, but of course this is not given to the, to the network at training. So what, what you see here is the weight of the attention. So the higher, the more the, the softmax were giving attention to this sentence, and, and the lower, uh, the, he, he was not looking at it. So basically the, you see that the first one, the most of the weights are given to the John Toot the milk there, because of course milk is mentioned, so that's a very high indicator. The second one is actually this question requires two sentences, so you don't really have to use the three steps. But the sentence is actually going from 88 to 1, so it's been reinforcing its, its belief. And what's interesting is that at the third step, you're actually switching to the other sentence. So you say, okay, I know, uh, where, I know that John has the milk, so where is John? This is what's happening here. And this works actually in multiple cases. I won't go too much into detail. But, uh, and this, the fact that I need to use this sentence and this sentence is not given. Okay, this is strange, just be the answer. So, where well, we saw that the LSTM was completing four tasks, we need 10,000 examples, this memory network can complete like 17. Okay, and, uh, and 
the new component is reduced memory. And recently, basically two years after the tasks were introduced, the, all the tasks have been solved uh, by some new architecture that are relying on this process, but more complicated. But <laughs> this very simple task actually took a, a lot of effort to basically solve them. So now that I show that, I would like to move to real language data because this is actually, I mean, this data set is really made to design this kind of algorithm. It's small, there is no noise, uh, everything uh, fits in memory, uh, etc. So then the, the, next, uh, the next generation of work was to try to say, okay, let's take this and try to apply it in the real world. So here the real world is going to be open domain question answering, or as you could call it, answer question on any topic. So let's say you have the question, what year, what year was the movie Blade Runner released? Okay, so then basically what you're going to use instead of the, sto instead of the story is that you have this knowledge base that we talked before that contain a lot of facts. So here in this case, the knowledge base may be IMDB, like the Internet Movie Database, contains a lot of information, this triple, like Blade Runner directed by Ridley Scott, Blade Runner released year 1982, etc. So here I just show the one that are relevant to Blade Runner, but you can see that you have like, in, the, in IMDB you would have like uh, millions of them. And so when you do question answering, usually the way it works is that you have the question, you're going to select the fact that is relevant and you answer from it. Okay, can you describe Blade Runner in a few words? You're going to pick the Blade Runner hashtags, dystopian, noir, police, androids, and you can generate an answer. So we like the memory network to do the same. So how does it work? Well, you have the question, and then in the knowledge source, you replace your small story by the knowledge base. These are, you can actually express the knowledge base with words or symbols as well, so you can actually use the same algorithm. The big problem here is that you have millions of them. The here, the softmax might scale to like 100 or maybe... Uh, let's say 1,000 slots. And if you have more than that, the problem right now is that either it doesn't scale, you can't train it because it's just too big, or even you can't really learn it because the softmax is going to be very too flat and uh, the, the network is not able to basically pick the, find what is the, the relevant. So what you have to do is that you have to use some kind of classic uh, information retrieval step where basically you are going to say, okay, I'm going to sample, uh, to select, sub, sub, uh, select from the knowledge base all the triple that basically relevant to the question. Here in this case, it could be some really like uh, entity matching uh, step where I will, I'm going to look at the entity matching the question. I'm going to look at all the triple that contain the entity and I'm going to populate the, the memory just with those. So in this case, all those containing Blade Runner. And if I have that and I can actually reduce to basically like a, a few hundred, then I can do the same thing and train a, a neural network to work as it was doing before. So of course, in this case, it's working uh, relatively well, but of course the information retrieval, uh, if, it's, if it's not putting in the memory the relevant memory slot, then you can't recover from that. And that's where I was talking about mixing like non-differentiable and differentiable components. Here in this case, you come back prop through that because it would just be, uh, it's, it's not made for it. So you need to use, if you would like to learn from that, you have to find the ways like using black blocks optimization technique or something like that. And that's, that's, that's a major working point. But nonetheless, you can achieve like a very interesting uh, performance. I mean, in this case, 80% compared to 93% that was the state of the art on this data set. But still, there is a gap. And so what's interesting is that what, how we can solve the gap. And so that's where I like the fact that we can actually bridge neural network with more like a symbolic system. Because you could say that you are basically have some prior knowledge on the task and that you can put it on the network. So you can know that which knowledge source do the memory have been extracted from. Uh, you can also know if there is semantics in this knowledge source. And so if you look at these triples, uh, basically there is a, there is some, this is not just a plain uh, sentence with no structure. There is like what we call subject and object and a predicate. Uh, there is a very strong structure there. And if you look at the, question, at the task we have, you could say that there is part of the memory that are more matching the question and some that are more matching the, the answer. Like who directed the movie Blade Runner, you would match that to the question and this to the answer. So, you could actually do something that is a very simple trick. Uh, it's going to say, okay, I'm going to split the memories uh, into two parts. One part that's connected for the addressing part and one part that's connected to the reading part. Okay, so that's, that's very simple. I just rely on this, but it's a, it's a very super strong nonlinearity because uh, between Blade Runner directed by and Ridley Scott, if you look at the abelic space, if you look at the weights, they are very, they are, there is, the function there is very complicated, but using the symbols is actually trivial. So how does it work? It works exactly the same, except that basically when I'm at the stage of basically reading the memory, the question comes in, I'm going to compute this weight just using this part. So which means basically the attention weight are going to be computed by using the, the similarity with this part. 
And then when I, re when I computed this attention, then the, read the reading part is going to be reading the representation of this part. So basically, I'm going to say I'm going to compute the attention using the beginning of the triple, but then I'm going to be the reading using the end of the triple. And I can do that multiple times. Okay, so the, the algorithm is almost the same. You just change a little bit in the, in the code the way you structure the data. And still, you can train end to end, whereas you have this that is actually uh, pretty tricky for a classic system. And, and so when you do that, of course, your, your structure is much better because for the system, it was for the same triple, you had to basically learn that the triple was, can be used as a, as a reading, as the addressing part, as the reading part. It was actually, it has basically to learn to split it, etc. If you split it for it because you actually know the semantics, then the, the job is much easier and you can actually out, outperform much better than what were the core system doing. So the last part now, and because I still have time, so it's wonderful. Um, I would like to, uh, to go to uh, something even more challenging, but I, I find even more interesting is going directly from text. So why do we do that? Is that I show that how you do question answering from knowledge base. Okay, so you look at the, at the triple and then you try to find the right triple and answer from it. But of course, if I ask in Blade Runner who built the replicant, the problem there is that simply the triple doesn't exist. And I mentioned at the beginning when I talk about knowledge base that basically there is this big problem of either having a lot of noisy triples or you have a lot of missing triples. And, so, and this is going to be always a, a problem because you're always missing information. So the way you do usually is that you do information extraction. You're going to say, okay, I'm going to go to Wikipedia and I'm going to, do, to try to extract some knowledge from it. So let's say I have the, the sentence, uh, uh, which engineer replicant, which are visually indistinguished, is is okay, from adult humans, are manufactured by the powerful tire corporation. Okay, if you can interpret this, then you can add the, in the knowledge base the fact that replicant has been manufactured by Tarek Corporation. And then if you have that, you can use the system I presented before, and you have a chance to be able to answer, whereas before you didn't. But of course, this is actually already a pretty tricky task, okay? Because this sentence doesn't say replicant have been manufactured by Tarek Corporation. And uh, interpreting this to do that is already complex, and you usually add a lot of noise when you do so. So, the idea is that can we basically try to skip the knowledge base and go directly to the, to the text? Okay, so now the system becomes, uh, the problem becomes, I have Wikipedia, and I have the question what year was the movie Blade Runner released? And now I, I have to find basically the, the slot of the text that contains the answer, and that could look like the triple before, but it's much uh, more noisy and less structured because of course there are multiple ways to express the same information. Can you describe Blade Runner in a few words? Then you basically have the first sentence, that's actually pretty useful. And in Blade Runner, who beat the replicant? Well, you have it as well, because we just saw it. So the, the goal um, in this, and we created the data set for that, was basically to see how well we could match the performance of system trained on the knowledge base, but using text. So we created a data set for which you had a knowledge base that contained all the answers, but then also the counterpart of Wikipedia for, that contained also all the answers. And we say, how much do I lose when I move to the, from the knowledge base to the, the text? And we also push the, the same algorithm, so the, the memory network I showed before with this key value trick. And the, the only difference here is that when I do the information retrieval step, instead of retrieval some parts of the, the knowledge base that basically contain uh, the entity, I'm going to basically try to look at some windows of text uh, in, the, in, the, in Wikipedia that, that mention some of the entities. So this is a bit trickier, and I'm go, go, not going to go into detail. And most importantly, it adds much more uh, things in the memory, so you have to be more careful. But when you have that, you can actually do the same trick. Let's say that like, I can have this, uh, this sentence that is a 1988 American Neo Noir, directed by Ridley Scott and starring, written by Fancher and DP. So this basically can become the, the information. And we use the same trick, which is that basically from the triple, we're going to say that the word in the middle is going to be the, the value that of interest to give the same, uh, the same uh, information that we were given before by saying this is the context related to the entity that could be relevant for answering and this is the entity that could be the potential answer. So the decoupling again context and the potential answer in the way the addressing and the reading was done uh, is also beneficial in this case. And you can do other things. You can also say, okay, I'm going to say every time, uh, every context I have, I'm going to add as a potential answer, the, the page it comes from. It doesn't cost much, it's very easy, 
But usually, you, we look at the data set, and a lot of the time, basically, the answer is the title of a page, because there are a lot of pages. And so when you do that, you basically give a higher chance to basically being able to, to pick them. Because you could have like written by this writer, and the answer was like, who wrote Blade Runner? And this could be interesting. So uh, when you do that, basically, uh, we are able to achieve like something that is, let's say, promising in the sense that the, the model learning the knowledge base or above 990 is at the noise level, which is above 90%. Um, when you, this is when you use an information extraction trick. So you say, I'm going to build a knowledge base, but using information extraction. Uh, and so how well could I perform? And so you, the drop that you see here is basically the drop that is occurred by the noise of the information extraction process. It's basically like 20 points. Okay? And if you basically read directly from text and you have this trick, yes, you're, you're lower than basically having a knowledge base, uh, but you, you can actually have something uh, close. So uh, I, I will now conclude with uh, just one example, which is the latest thing we did, which we call Dr. QA. In this case, the first work was only on the movie domain, and now we basically try to answer for the full Wikipedia on any question. So it's 5 million articles. And so in this case, you can basically uh, ask any question. So this morning I asked, what is the solution to artificial intelligence? Okay, and the system said, heuristics are rules of thumb. Okay, so <laughs> I guess uh, that's maybe, it makes me skeptical. Um, and, and, and you can also ask it why you say that. So the, basically the, the system picked the article artificial intelligence and then he went on the whole uh, article and, uh, and he read the sentence, the solution for many problems is to use heuristics or rules of thumb that eliminate choices that are unlikely to lead to the goal. Okay. So basically, if you look at the, this, it seems like an answer, but you see also how much further we are from true understanding of knowledge. And if you look at question and answer from Wikipedia, the, the accuracy of such a system is like 30%. So it's not a solve, uh, solve thing. Um, the only, the, my last slide for conclusion could be that I think I mentioned training at the beginning. Right now, everything I showed was basically training from question and answer that were given for the task of, of question answering. But I think uh, it's going to be limited uh, because not everything is actually a question and answer. And it's required label data as well. So the, the, the work on, on Wikipedia is using 100,000 questions. Okay, it still has limitation, but you won't be able to ask people to label like 1 million questions that contain everything. Um, and if you want to do to reinforce learning, you need to basically have an environment providing you reward. And that's also not obvious uh, in language. So a solution that we feel is very uh, promising is basically to try to learn via interaction. And I think uh, uh, Cordelia mentioned that. And in this case, it means that basically learning by speaking to a system directly, which means that the system is able to learn when you just speak to it. And, and just this work here, that you could actually check if you want, is basically a way to say that you say, where is Mary? And the answer should be playground, but the system doesn't give you the answer. It can say you something else in, in, uh, in language. And the idea is that how can, you, can I, can I uh, interpret a sentence that is casually given by a speaker as potential reward? When we say, oh, thank you, that's very helpful. And when you say, what do you say? It's completely nonsense to someone. It might induce that you understand or you didn't understand what we're saying, or basically that the answer for the system was uh, positive or was good or not. And I think it could be very promising if we could actually use that so that you don't need labeler, you just need to have people talking to systems. Uh, this is a conclusion, but um, I think I can finish here. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, yes. If I could just mention that all the, all the code of what I talked about is on the github.com slash Facebook research. And the data is on this page, so it's on the slide, but basically you can try everything. Thank you. Um, let, let's have questions now. Yes. Okay, I have a technical question. In, in your very uh, first example, the distance that you are using looked like a hyperbolic distance. Is it? Yes, it is. Uh, why is it better than any other one? Um, because, uh, so problem in this case is it's not my work, so I will try to explain oh, it the sorry. best I want. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, no, I think the idea is that uh, you can actually have a different uh, weight depending on how connected you are. And so I think the distance is going to be modulated by the, by the norm of uh, the component themselves, and the, component, the norm of the components is going to be influenced by their popularity, which is that the, the distance between two people that are 
very uh, popular, so highly connected, and the distance between two people that are less connected are going to be different. And this, and I, you should check the paper to know more, is really showing the, the way that you can actually have the space that organizes itself. If you don't do that, the way you learn these embeddings, they have a local distance that, that is meaningful, so in many parts of the space, if you're closer, you are, if you're close, you're similar, but you don't have like this long range uh, structure over the whole space. You just have like a local neighborhood. And this is the first time where basically you can learn something that has a global consistency. Yeah. Yes, I, I've got a, a little mobile okay. and he's speaking to me. <laughs> and, and once I, I was angry and uh, I, I was rude. Okay. And then he told me, he called me by my name and he said, oh, no, don't be so rude, please. Okay. <laughs> Is it difficult to do that? Uh, no, I think it's, it's hard-coded. So I think it, it's difficult. The speech recognition is difficult. So he was able to, uh, to transcribe the word you said. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's, very, that's very important. But then I think it was just like, he has a list of keywords that are like rude words, and he has a pre-encoded pre sentence that says, you shouldn't say that. <laughs> that's, that's the most probable answer, I think. Uh, Jean Salançon, this way. Yes, thank you. I have a non-technical comment, and just uh, about maybe semantic. We are all, you are always speaking about learning, but I think one uh, point we are stumbling on is the difference between learning and understanding. And if we shift to French language, understanding is comprendre, that is putting things together. And I think this is a real point. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, I completely agree. I try to, uh, so I would like to learn to understand. So, uh, the, no, see, so I think the, here the, the point is that, um, the point I tried to make at the beginning is that understanding should be able to basically connect the language to basically uh, a structured representation or in whatever form that is basically connecting the concept together and multimodal, etc. So, uh, and I think the, the grounding could be that the language is going to be connected to this, and this is going to give us like some uh, interpretation in the sense of connecting to other things we saw in the past in the same way, etc. Or triggering a small program inside that basically is going to do some deduction, etc. Um, but uh, so I completely agree with that. I think the learning part is really that I think this grounding we are going to have to the machine to learn it, and we can't really uh, hard code the machine to to do it directly. So I think that's, that's well. And I don't really know what the, the red representation is as well. So that's the tricky part. Olivier Pironeau. Uh, of course, you have competitors, uh, Google and Siri. Uh, and uh, yeah. uh, is this research uh, public? I mean, how much, uh, how much do you know about your competitors? <laughs> so uh, so all, the all the stuff I talked today and even new stuff are completely public. They're all on archive uh, on this uh, GitHub repo, so you can check the code. Um, so this is completely public. Uh, and the research we do at Facebook AI Research is completely public as well. So we have a team uh, at Facebook doing like some bots, etc. But actually, it's not my team. So, uh, so I can talk about everything I do. <laughs> uh, and this is basically this. And I, I wouldn't put that in a product today, because I think it's a bit risky. Uh, it's, it's too wrong uh, most of the time, but because it's a, it's a research work. Um, about my competitor, uh, I don't know much more than you do, uh, I think. So I, I think I have an idea about what the state of the art of research in language understanding is uh, and what are the drawbacks. But then it doesn't mean that uh, you can't actually do a good product with the current state of the technology. And uh, I think that's what the, the team are trying to build. Okay, so for instance, for, uh, for dialogue system, I think it would, it's, uh, it's complicated to build a dialogue system that can answer to everything all the time uh, because that's too difficult. But you can have interesting product with the limited cap uh, capacity we have, if there is a small domain on which you want really to be able to answer question. Let's say the weather, etc. If you do just for that, and you know that you, and your, your system can only do this, or play the music, or control your house, etc., then you have a, a better chance to have something that actually is useful, because you restrict a lot the, the, the space in which people are going to ask questions. But that's the difference between the state of language understanding and building a, a good product. Claude Béroux. Yes, in the, the examples you, you give for the question answering problem uh, are nearly always, I think always, uh, 
statements that are positive, not negations. Hmm. Is it so difficult to, to deal with negations? Um, yes. Uh, in general, it's, 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 so it's very difficult for this embedded space at the beginning because embedded space, they really like to put things together. Okay, negation is really putting things far away, okay? but they are still connected in a way. So you, you can't put... It's sort of, usually embedding, they would like to put you close together if you're similar, or otherwise, as far as you can. Okay, but for negation, it's more complicated because it's already, it's already you need to have really a, a very specific thing to say, we are far away but connected in a, in a way. And so that doesn't work very well with this space readily. For the, for the neural network by himself, no, they, they can work, uh, but you have to do special care uh, usually, uh, I would say. Because otherwise, they are, you know, we are, this is learning on the data statistics and the negation are lost uh, usually, you don't have 50% of uh, affirmative and 50% of negative question in your whole training set. And so usually, that's the problem. The negation are going to be uh, forgotten because like a specific case. And so if you don't pay attention too much, the system will learn negation as uh, affirmation. So you have to be a bit careful with that, as with any bias in data set, by the way. I think we'll have to stop uh, this time. Thank, Thank you. you very much.